Uh, thank you, Brother Harrison. That was a beautiful testimony. And I really appreciate the emphasis on righteousness by faith and uh, gaining victory over sin. And uh, it's just uh, wonderful to see how God has been at work in your life and uh, just the joy of baptizing your father and seeing him being born again as well. That must be brought great joy to your life and to your heart. So uh, it's my privilege to come and share with you here this evening. Um, and I'm going to be talking, uh, really kind of following on what Brother Harrison was talking about. Uh, we didn't plan these, these uh, uh, talks together, um, but as we come through uh, what I want to share tonight, you'll see that um, we're both kind of following along a very similar theme, which is essentially that um, to be saved, we are to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so um, I'm going to, uh, I had three parts to tonight's talk, but it's cut down to two, so... Um, I'm going to just talk about Satan's complication and God's loving resolution. And uh, this is how it relates to the sexual revolution happening all around us here today. I invite you to bow your heads with me and we invite the presence of the Holy Spirit once again. Heavenly Father, as we gather here tonight in this house of worship, uh, Father, I want to thank you that you did not send your Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. And so, Father, tonight we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus, you promised, if we ask, we shall receive. And so tonight we're asking that uh, you will give us this, the gift of your Spirit, uh, Father, not just to be present, but to uh, transform and renew our thinking, to soften our hearts, to bring us conversion and conviction afresh, and to lead us in the way of life everlasting. So, Lord, speak through me and speak for me. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So I just want to start out by summarizing what I was going to say in my first 15, 20 minutes, which is this, that God's ideal plan for the human race, for human sexuality and the human family was ultimately for biological males to be married to biological females in monogamous, heterosexual, lifelong committed marriages, and for those marriages to be blessed with children um, through which the world will be subdued and God will be represented in all corners of the earth as we are his ambassadors here on earth. And so with that kind of very brief summary of my first 15 minutes, let's move on to how Satan mucked things up. And I want to talk specifically tonight about what has happened in the West in the last 70 years, in our lifetime. And so I want to talk about Satan's complication, how Satan brought um, through a spanner in the works in the West to take us from being societies based on a Judeo-Christian foundation to societies that are based on something very, very different. And we're going to see how this leads to the paradox of the modern LGBTQ movement and the philosophy of despair that our modern Western young people are inhabiting today. So um, we want to go back to France, which is, um, uh, speaking from an English perspective, all right, I may be biased in this, but um, some good things did come out of France. That was William the Conqueror because he left France but in 1066. But if we go back to the 1960s, uh, there were some French existentialist philosophers, and their names were Michel Foucault, Jacques Derrida, and uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard. They, are, they were known um, collectively as the French existentialists. Uh, and they had these, these, these views that there was no purpose, no meaning in life, and in order to um, attain purpose or meaning, you had to act upon your will. And so if I help an old lady across the road, or if I choose to push her in front of a truck, both of those actions are morally equivalent because I'm choosing to act upon the will. And that's how I self-authenticate my otherwise meaningless existence. Well, um, out of their views come something uh, that was articulated, and we now know that as being postmodernism. Now, postmodernism is hard to define, maybe by design, but it is a rejection of modernism, which is the intellectual movement that dominated the West from the mid-19th to the mid-20th centuries. And it is also a rejection of modernity, and it rejects the possibility of objective universal knowledge. So postmodernism rejects the, um, the dichotomy between the objective universal and the subjective personal. And what it does is it moves the center and the locus of truth away from the Word of God as being a universal absolute. It moves the locus and the focus of truth to being your subjective lived experience and to your narrative and to what Oprah Winfrey might say is your truth. So postmodernism moves us quite drastically um, philosophically. So um, they, there are two essential um, principles of postmodernism. 
One is a radical skepticism about whether objective knowledge or truth is possible. So postmodern philosophy prefers constructu cultural constructivism and moral relativism. So all truth is tied to your cultural frame of reference. And so um, out of this idea, um, in modern theories, we come to them a bit later, um, but say um, critical race theory would argue that, that um, race is a social construct, and to a large extent it is, because there is only one race, the human race. And the differentiations that we've artificially made are the results of satanic deceptions coming into humanity. But when it comes to gender, the gender theorists also argue that gender is a human co social construct, and it varies from society to society. And some gender societies may emphasize two genders, and some may emphasize maybe 20 genders. So the social constructivist view uh, that comes out of, of postmodernity, it affects our children in our schools today. The second principle that comes out of postmodernity, as listed on the screen there, is that societies are, are organized primarily by the powerful in or into identity groups and to social hierarchies. And we know this is to a large extent true, uh, but those hierarchies only serve the interests of the powerful and the elites, who in turn define what is knowledge and what is acceptable behavior and what is acceptable knowledge and what you can and cannot say within that given society. And so out of that principle, later on, we have it, the principle of intersectionality, which is a subset of critical race theory. So these are the two driving principles of postmodernity. Now, there are four implications to this. One is that all meaningful boundaries are to be problematized and blurred because allegedly all boundaries only serve the powerful and the elites in society, and they exploit the oppressed. And so that is why we've seen in the last 70 years in the West a blurring of almost every boundary that we know of. And it's interesting that in the flood, uh, in creation, we realize that life is possible because God made distinctions between the water above and the water below, between the land and the sea, between night and day, and between male and female. And life is only possible with those distinctions. And in the flood, God erased the distinction between earth and sea, and water above, and water below, and most life came to a shuddering halt. Now, we sociologically cannot change uh, night, night and day, we cannot change earth and sea, we cannot change water above and water below, but we are doing our best to dissolve human society now in the West by blurring the boundaries between male and female. And just as God overrode those distinctions in the flood, leading to um, the loss of almost all human life, the, 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 the logical implication is that our societies are going to implode as we blur the distinctions that God has set up in the creative order. So the first um, application of postmodern theory is that all meaningful boundaries are to be blurred. Secondly, that language is actually the tool of the oppressors, and it must be deconstructed in order to allow the oppressed to construct and express their own knowledge and to achieve power via language that legitimizes themselves within society from their unique perspective. Uh, modern, in modern philosophy, philosophical terms, um, we, know, we know this as standpoint epistemology, which is I see the world from my perspective, you see the world from your perspective. If you're an oppressor and I'm oppressed, that means that my, my perspective is more legitimate than yours perspective. And so that's how the general theory works in, in, in critical theory. Uh, the next principle that comes along is that all cultures are equal, that uh, no culture is superior to another. It is therefore impossible to critique your own society from within why? Because the master's tools will never dethrone the master in any given society. This is how the theory works. Are you following me on this? Now, we're going to see the implications of this in a few minutes, and the implications are pretty profound. And the fourth principle that, that comes out of postmodernity is that the individual, that is you as a person, you are replaced by a group identity. Once you divide society into the oppressed and the oppressors, then you, it is your job, your journey of discovery, to find your identity, not as a Christian in Jesus Christ, to all who believed he gave the power to become the sons and daughters of God, John 1 and verse 12, uh, created with a heavenly purpose for an eternal future. No, uh, within this atheist worldview of postmodernity, um, your identity is now driven by the sociological group that you choose to identify with. LGBTQ are classical groups. Ethnic minorities are classical groups. Um, religious minorities are some other group identities that are out there. There are many group identities, and some group identities are viewed as inherently good, and some group identities are viewed as inherently evil. That's how 
these hierarchies of privilege and oppression work within postmodernity and modern day critical theory. Now, postmodernity comes out of a disillusionment with what happened in Europe in the 19, uh, 1910s, about 1945, World War I and World War II. See, the philosophers, in, if, you, if you watch, are you, are you familiar with Avon Lee, the series, Anne of Green Gables? Yes. yes. And if you watch that series, uh, all of the stories of those kids growing up in somewhere in um, Prince Edward Island, there's always the, the, the prospect of the latest technology coming into the village. The telephone arrives, indoor toilets arrive, heating arrives, the vehicle arrives. And, and the, 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 the theme throughout that series is that technology is bringing inevitable human progress. And that was the idea in the West all up until 1914. And after the horror of, my, of the First World War and of the Second World War, and to give you a scale of the horror, on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the British Army lost 50,000 men. 50,000 men. More than we lost, I think, almost the same as Vietnam, maybe, from, from America. The Brit Brits lost that um, in the first day. The scale of the slaughter was horrendous. And so postmodernism represents a disillusionment with the promise that technology will improve humanity's existence. Rather than improving us morally, all that technology does, it gives us the means to kill each other more efficiently. And so they, there was a disillusionment with um, technology. There was a disillusionment with democracy because democracy led to Adolf Hitler. It was a disillusionment with, with Karl Marx because that led to the horrors of the Gulag under Stalin. And there was a disillusionment with technology in general. And so this postmodern um, theory or philosophy that has, has overtaken the West uh, to a large extent today, it represents a loss of meaning and purpose and is essentially a philosophy of despair at the underlying human condition. It's a philosophy of despair. That with all our advancements, all it means is that we just become more wicked. The more we advance sociologically, economically, politically, or technologically, all it does is it increases our capacity for evil and it does not result in a change of the human heart so we actually care for one another within our societies. And so postmodernism is a reaction to the horrors of what happened in Europe in the 1910s through to the 1945 and the end of World War II. In postmodern theory, nothing has purpose or meaning. Now, this is the dominant philosophy in the West today. We inhabit a philosophy of despair in the West. All the subsets of postmodernity, post such as logical positivism, the, the other things that branch out from it, these are attempts to find meaning within a philosophical world that denies the possibility of meaning. And this is the philosophy that is in our schools, it's in our culture, it's in our movies, and as we're going to see, it's in the music that our young people are listening to. It's a philosophy of despair where nothing has meaning. Now, in the divine creation, uh, creation is filled with a divine purpose. Uh, we heard earlier this week that God created humanity not so that it, um, we're not just the climax of humanity, but we serve a broader purpose. And so within, within the creation um, worldview that we find in Genesis 1 through 3, sexual intimacy is not the end in and of itself, but God gives us sexual intimacy in order to deepen the love relationship within a divinely appointed marriage and also to bring about children with all the hope and joy that they represent. And it is in having children that we gain a deeper appreciation for our Heavenly Father. You know, when you have children, you start to learn the meaning of sacrifice and self-denial and doing good for somebody else. When you have children, you start to understand how God views you. That as I go astray growing up and my parents prayed over me and wanted the best for me, and when you have children and they start going astray and you're praying over them, you start to get a glimpse of the father in the parable of the prodigal son. And so God gives us children in order that we might better appreciate God's love and his grace for each one of us. And so in the, in the divine way of, 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 of thinking, in the, the, the worldview that we have from Scripture, um, the sexual act is not an end in and of itself. It is a means by which God reveals things to us about ourselves. It is a means by which the marriage is strengthened and deepened. It is a means by which we have children, we propagate the human species, and we subdue the earth and have dominion on the earth. And it's also the means by which God grows our characters and fits us for eternity. So there are many, there are many purposes uh, in the biblical model that, uh, for, for the sexual act that go way beyond the sexual act itself. 
But from a postmodern perspective, nothing philosophically has purpose or meaning or an end goal. Therefore, the sexual act is the end in and of itself. It doesn't lead to anything because nothing intrinsically leads to anything in postmodernism, postmodernity. The sexual act is the end in and of itself. Now, what does that mean? Well, that means that the sexual act is, has the most intimate expression possible of yourself, um, thus becomes the end in and of itself, which is why there is a fierce focus on sexual identity for modern man, because without it, man is nothing. It's the ultimate expression of you within a postmodern worldview in which we now inhabit, and therefore there is nothing beyond that. So your sexual identity now becomes the locus and the focus and the center and the grounding of everything that is important in your life. Are you following this? Okay. So modern man is caught in an impossible paradox. The search for meaning of modern man comes within our rejection of God's plan for human sexuality. And the search for meaning within the LGBTQ movement is denied by the sexual revolution's underlying philosophical premise, which is that postmodernism post is true, that nothing has intrinsic meaning, that life has no meaning or purpose, that life is futile. So ultimately, this is the tragedy of what we see on the streets of America today. Postmodernism is the cradle of despair that gives birth to the sexual revolution. And the search for meaning in the sexual revolution is denied by the underlying philosophy of despair. It's a tragedy. It's an absolute tragedy. People are searching for meaning within a philosophical worldview that denies the possibility of meaning. And we're going to plumb ever greater depths of physical activity and physical depravity, trying to find that satisfaction. But as Mick Jagger sang, you can't get no satisfaction. There is no satisfaction when you philosophically inhabit a universe that denies the possibility of meaning or purpose or an end goal to anything. And so the, the, the frantic, the frenetic, the almost despairing um, madness of the rush into the sexual revolution is, is the attempt to find meaning on the part of young people today who may, not, who may or may not realize it, may not be able to articulate it in such a way, but the entire sexual revolution from the 60s onwards was birthed by a philosophy of despair. This is the tragedy of the human condition in 2020s America. It's an absolute tragedy. Now, any philosophy of despair cannot last for long. Postmodern theory mutated in the 1990s to focus on power societies in, in, in society, out of which arose a number of what we call critical theories. Those are listed in no particular order. Post-colonial studies was one of the first to come out. Critical race theory um, started at Harvard. Um, with Professor Bell, uh, disability and fat studies, LGBTQ studies, queer theory, and the dominant version today is critical gender theory. Now, this is an atheist perversion of God's divine intent for humanity, born of a philosophy of despair that is destroying children and young people worldwide. We're involved in a spiritual battle here. It isn't just a battle between the French philosophers of the 60s and Jesus Christ from 2,000 years ago. Every temptation from Satan is a lie. All these thoughts that are put into young people's minds are coming from Satan. This is a spiritual battle between Christ and Satan for the future of our young people and the young people of America. And it's not just a matter of counseling and it's not just a matter of, of therapy. It's a matter of rebuking the demons that are driving this process in the individual's life because we're involved in combat with Satan for the eternal futures of our young people. To be created in the image of God means, among other things, that we have the ability to reproduce. The four stages of transition are the social, such as the pronouns, the psychological to overcome inherited um, um, transphobia, as it's called. The third stage is the hormonal transition by which you will never have children again. And the fourth stage is the surgical transition, the top and bottom surgery, as it's called. And once you go down that path, there is no coming back. You can never regain the ability to have children and to be engaged in reproduction or even normal sex life or any kind of sex life uh, once you've gone down that transition. Now, if the ability to reproduce is a gift of being created in the image of God, then um, mutilating children actually recreates them in the image of Satan because Satan's can angels cannot reproduce. 
So we're defacing the image of God in his creation and put churning out young people who now have, bear the image of Satan in their bodies because they've lost the ability to reproduce. They have no impact on mental health, emotional wellness, and they have a lifetime of expensive medical bills to look forward to. This is a satanic battle that we're engaged in. It's Christ against Satan. It's the great controversy being lived out in every psychotherapist or phys physician's consulting room today. But nothing, as we say, nothing happens in a vacuum and there is a loving resolution to this problem. No person remains uninfluenced by the external forces that shape our society. So if we, if we drill down as we are doing a bit here tonight and we look beyond the, the chaos, the abandon and the pain of the LGBTQ community, we come to the heart of the matter. Now critical race theory and critical gender theory are the bitter fruit of the underlying atheist central critical theory which is the application of postmodern theory, which was birthed out of French existentialism and is essentially a philosophy of nihilistic despair. Nothing matters. You don't matter. I don't matter. If I live, if I die, you have no purpose. The mountains don't care. The universe simply does not care. This is the philosophical foundation on which the sexual revolution is built. That humanity has no intrinsic purpose. Life has no meaning, there are no moral absolutes, nothing is ultimately right or wrong. Whether you live or die, it matters not. Nothing matters, nothing has meaning, nothing has purpose. I don't matter and you certainly don't matter. This is the philosophical trap that the mire in which the modern generation is unwittingly caught. But part of the good news of the gospel is that God reaches us where we are. And we, we kind of drill down and drill down and we, and we drill down. I want to say tonight that there's an essential agreement tonight, today, between the, the most radical LGBT activists on the one side and disciples of Jesus Christ on the other. And the essential agreement is this, is that without God, humanity has no purpose. Now, the LGBTQ activists may have taken us through critical theory and the critical um, areas of study I've listed on the screen here in the last 50 years. They may have got started from the bedrock of despair and said, we're going to try and find a meaning in the human sexual experience. But if your entire philosophy is based on, on, on a foundation that nothing has meaning, you'll never find meaning in the house that you build. So we can agree with every pride parade, pride parade marcher today that a life apart from God has no meaning. We're in essential agreement. We're not at philosophical war with you. When we drill down to philosophical bedrock, we agree 100% with the sexual revolution. You ain't gonna get any satisfaction in what you're doing if you're built on a foundation of futility and despair. So there is essential agreement between Christians and LGBTQ activists today Without God, our hopes, our dreams, our loves, our successes, our failures are intrinsically meaningless. And we can all agree on this. Without God, the philosophy of despair that haunts the modern LGBTQ movement haunts the heart. Now, I grew up in England, so I'm gonna quote an English pop song here. You heard, of, maybe some of you heard of the, the rock group Queen. They had a lead singer called Freddie Mercury. He was dying of AIDS. He sang at the Live Aid concert in 1985. He, was, he died of AIDS shortly thereafter. And uh, one, pretty much one of the last album they released had a song in it called The Show Must Go On. And I want to read the lyrics to that song because this perfectly captures the dilemma that the sexual revolution finds itself in. The song goes like this. Empty spaces, what are we living for? Abandoned places, I guess we know the score. On and on, does anybody know what we are looking for? Another hero, another mindless crime, behind the curtain in the pantomime. Hold the line, does anybody want to take it anymore? The show must go on, the show must go on. Inside my heart is breaking, my makeup may be flaking, but my stump smile still stays on. Whatever happens, verse three, I leave it all to chance. Another heartache, another failed romance. On and on, does anybody know what we are living for? I guess I'm learning, I must be warmer now. I'll soon be turning round the corner now. Outside, the dawn is breaking. But inside, in the dark, 
I'm aching to be free. Now that became, and it still is, one of the most popular rock anthems that are sung in rock concerts around the world even today. The show must go on. It is often played near the end of rock concerts. Many of Queen's rock songs are designed to be sung by you know, 80,000 people in a stadium. This is one of their most famous songs. The show must go on. And they wrote this when and Freddie Mercury, when they were recording this song, he could barely function in the recording studio. He was about to die from HIV AIDS related complications. And so, I want to, that's where we are as our modern society. Just look at the last line of each verse. Does anybody know what we are looking for? Does anybody want to take it anymore? Does anybody know what we are living for? Inside in the dark, I'm aching to be free. This is the anthem of a doomed generation, of a doomed philosophy that says to our young people, there is no purpose, there is no meaning. Nothing is right, nothing is wrong. Do what you can, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die, and then you see what happens after that. But the truth of the matter is, we all yearn to matter, do we not? We, learn, we yearn to see and to be seen. We yearn to hear and to be heard. We yearn to accept and to be accepted. We yearn to be vulnerable without the fear of rejection, which is why divorce is such a painful thing. It's okay if a work colleague doesn't like you, but if your spouse of 20 years turns their back on you, that cuts you to the very core because they know everything about you, and they're saying you're not worth staying with. That's why divorce is so painful for so many people. And beyond that, we yearn to love and to be loved. And so the cry of the human heart at such fundamental odds um, with the philosophy of despair that gave birth to the sexual revolution is unheard today by an uncaring universe. So we must make a choice. We need to make a choice. When we come down to that, uh, that bedrock of common understanding that nothing has meaning, nothing has purpose apart from God, you can either go one path, which is the LGBTQ movement, and seek meaning and purpose in a world that philosophically says it's never going to happen, but I want to share with you tonight there is another path that you can take, and that is the path of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is another path you can take. You see, I stand here, yes, as a pastor and, and so forth. We, we acquire titles like, like um, barnacles appear on the, the bottoms of ships these days. But I stand before you as a broken human being with inherited tendencies to evil, with the capacity to hurt and the capacity to be hurt, just like everybody else here tonight and watching online. I stand before you tonight with my own personal brokenness, knowing that God is good. Amen. You know, that one of my most famous verses in the Bible, at least for me, is this, so taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, if I were to ask you to describe ice cream to somebody who's never tasted ice cream, how would you describe it? I'd say, well, it's like sweet margarine. Now, does that really cut it? No, no, I mean, it's hard to describe ice cream to somebody who's never tasted it. Now, children all around the world, if you give them an ice cream cone, they know whatever culture they're from, they know they have to lick it. You know, I've never seen a child take a pair of chopsticks or a spoon to an ice cream cone. It's instinctive. We all love, uh, most people love ice cream. But the same is true of God. You have to taste and see that God is good for yourself. It's not just enough to hear about God or to preach about God. It's not just enough to sing the song Amazing Grace. We have to experience God's grace for ourselves. Only when we experience God for ourselves can we know that he is good. And so we're talking here about a philosophy of despair which is written by men who are long dead and who don't offer you anything or from that to that junction point where we have to make this decision, am I gonna follow the philosophy of despair and into the sexual revolution, or am I gonna taste and see that there is a living God who is good to me? And that's the decision everybody must make for themselves. So what is this good news? Well, first and foremost, let's go back to the scripture. What were we? What, was, what is our human condition apart from God? It is this, for while we were still what? At the right time, Christ died for the who? Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us that while we were what? 
Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we've been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were what? Enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. And notice this description of fallen humanity. We are weak, we are ungodly, we are sinners, we are enemies of God. Apart from God, this is our human condition. Paul goes on to say it just a bit in a few verses later. He says, therefore, just as what? Sin came into the world through one man and death came through sin. And so spread to all because all have sinned. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. So the description of humanity in the book of Romans and parallels what we find in the, in the philosophy of despair that dominates the streets today. We are helpless, we are ungodly, we are sinners, we are enemies of God, and we are condemned, and we are doomed to eternal death. That is the human condition. Apart from God, that is the human condition. And the solution? The solution is not found in any preacher's preaching. It's not found in a philosophical treatise. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the gospel is this, Romans 5, 12, and 18, it says, But now, apart from law, the righteousness of God has been dis 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 uh, disclosed and is attested to by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through what? Faith in Jesus Christ, Faith in Jesus Christ for all who? Believe. believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement or reconciliation by his blood. How is it effective? Through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has what? faith in Jesus Christ. So our salvation, our search for meaning is not found in none of ourselves. It is found in the cross of Calvary. And we receive that salvation, not through any works of our own, but repeated here in red, through faith in Jesus Christ, those who believe it is effective through faith. We are just the ones who have faith in Jesus are justified according to Romans here. We receive, as, our, as our, our Harrison said earlier, we receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We receive his righteousness by faith as the foundation for our salvation. So what happened on Calvary? Well, according to the Apostle Paul on Calvary, you were justified, that is, you were declared righteous. That is, innocent of all the wrongdoing of your, of your life. We were reconciled to God. On Calvary, God proved his love for you and for me, or some versions say he demonstrated his love for you. On Calvary, Colossians 1.20, God made peace with fallen humanity, reconciling all things, including me and you, unto himself. On Calvary, we were redeemed as we were brought back from slavery to sin, the wages of which is eternal death, and we were completely forgiven by God. We were crucified with Christ, who became a sin for you and I, and he died in our place. Because of Calvary, because of Calvary, to those who receive Jesus Christ and his death by faith, our sin is taken away and the guilt. We are released from the sins of our past. We may consider ourselves as of today dead to sin, the wages of which is death. We are no longer subject to the second or the eternal death that the scripture talks about. Satan no longer has authority or power over you. You are free from the fear of death, you are free from slavery to sin, and you are free from slavery to Satan himself. We were healed on Calvary of our sin condition, and we are no longer condemned. We are now, we are now friends with God, and for those who are in Christ Jesus, there is therefore no condemnation. Beautiful promise from the book of Romans there. This is some of the beautiful stuff that happened on Calvary. He didn't just die for us, a lot of things happened on the cross of Calvary. And we receive this by faith. It's not based on my salvation, your salvation is not based on the fact that I confess. Confession is a gift that God gives us. Repentance is a gift that God gives us. When the Holy Spirit moves upon our heart. But the basis for your salvation and my salvation is the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Our part is to receive the righteousness of Jesus by faith. To trust that what he did on Calvary was for me and for you. 
to trust that his sacrifice is, was, and always will be all sufficient to provide the grace to cover all my sins in my entire life. Now, because of Calvary, the wrong slide there, our part is to receive the righteousness of Christ by faith. I quoted this verse earlier, very famous verse, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that everybody who believes in him may not perish but have everlasting life. I've memorized it in a different version to this. Indeed, good dog, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Let's paraphrase this. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten Son, so that if you believe in him, you will not perish, but you will have eternal life. He will lift you out of this philosophy of despair, the cradle of the sexual revolution that says that nothing matters when you die, that's it, and there's nothing, nothing significant to your life. God says, no, I'm sending my son into the world for you. I did not send my son into the world to condemn you, but I sent my son into the world that you might be saved for eternity through him, through his life, his death, and his resurrection. In John 1.12, to those who believe, to all, who, to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave the power to become the children of God. And so to members of the LGBT community, many of whom are alienated from their parents, many of whom have been kicked out onto the streets, many of whom have, been, have experienced hostility and abuse at the hands of the, their wider families, many of whom, for instance, live under the streets, the, under the arches, the railway arches, the major cities, there is the promise of a new family, that you'll have a heavenly father and a very broken heart that has been wounded from the abuse and the, and, the, and the horror that's been visited upon it, there is a promise that I will give you a new heart. And to every person who has you know, slept with how many people, I know it's an old trope, the promiscuity, but to a certain extent it is true, and every time you sleep with somebody, then they move on to somebody else, so that sense of rejection, and will anybody love me for who I really am, there is the promise that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we start reading the promises of God to the members of the LGBT community in a whole new light because the promises of Scripture relate to the heart cry of the members within that community in a particular way and in a larger sense to all of us here tonight. Will we make mistakes going forward? Yes, but we are saved not by our own obedience but by the obedience of Jesus Christ. And we as Adventists need to remember that. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness as the life of Jesus Christ leads to justification and life for all. So for every Adventist who may be sitting here tonight or watching online and says, I have no assurance of salvation because I messed up today. If you're in a covenant relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a promise of forgiveness tonight. But your salvation is not based on you living a perfectly sinless, spotless life from now until you die. Your salvation was earned on Calvary by the only one who ever has lived the perfect, spotless, sinless life. And so tonight I'd encourage you, whether we're an Adventist and straight, whether we're non-Adventist and a part of the LGBTQ community, to fix our eyes upon Jesus on what he has done for us in Calvary and to receive his righteousness by faith. I'm going to trust you, Lord, that when you said all these things about what happened at Calvary, I'm going to trust you that it applies to me. And I'm therefore, every day, I'm going to ask God to create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and a right spirit within me. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. As was so um, articulately expressed earlier this week, it is somehow, it is a terrible thing to say to somebody that has same-sex attraction, uh, just don't act upon it and you'll be okay. Because life is a series of constant, I want it, I don't want it, I want it, I don't want it. And this is constant struggle going in. And we forget, the, we, we deny the power of God to give us a born-again experience to be a new man or a new woman in Jesus Christ, where the old has gone, and behold, there is nothing left but the new. Create me a clean heart, O God, and put a new right spirit within me. The Apostle Paul talks about this promise of God, of his work in our lives. He says, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. That means I may still struggle with some attractions, I may still struggle with some tendencies, but God knows, and he's the potter and I'm the clay, and he's gonna keep shaping me and prepare me for the eternity. Amen. And because only he knows my future, he's gonna prepare me and shape me so that when I eventually do die, I know my, my, my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life because I'm a work in progress 
and he's responsible for getting me across the finish line, not me. We daily ask for the mind of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said it this way, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And we could talk a lot about this, but essentially, to have the mind of Christ is to be filled daily by the Holy Spirit. As Harrison said a few minutes earlier, we do not teach once saved, always saved as Adventists. We teach from Scripture that you are once saved and then you are daily saved. Every day we surrender our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Every day we ask for the infilling and the baptism of his Holy Spirit to transform our characters. Every day we ask for the mind of Christ that his mind guide our thinking, his mind guide our decisions, his mind will guide our, apt, our, our tastes, our appetites, and that he will sanctify us day by day. And so like Newton, one day we can say, I'm not the man I want to be, but by God's grace, neither am I the man that I used to be. And we can all see that progress in our lives as we draw closer to Jesus, and our keep, we keep our eyes fixed on him. John 14, 16, Jesus promises us this. He says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. It's the promise of the Holy Spirit to all who ask in the name of Jesus Christ. And that Holy Spirit does many things in our lives, but one of the things he does is he fits us for heaven above. He changes our characters, changes our aptitudes, changes our app and our appetites. So the Apostle Paul can go on to say, but now you've been freed from sin and enslaved to God. The advantage you have is sanctification, that is today, the end is eternal life, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we have to make a decision, don't we? When we drill down to the philosophical bed, uh, foundation of the sexual revolution and the LGBTQ movement, it's essentially a philosophy of despair. Nothing has meaning. Nothing matters. Freddie Mercury sang it like that. Let me just put on the screen. Those four lines there are almost the anthem for modern Western youth. Does anybody know what we're looking for? Does anybody want to take it anymore? Does anybody know what we're living for? But inside in the dark, I'm aching to be free. And this cry of despair, the search for meaning, the search for identity, the search for significance in our modern society is expressed through the plethora of sexual identities that are popping up all over the place. It's the cry of the human heart for meaning and purpose, the desire to be loved and to love, to see and to be seen, to accept and to be accepted, to know that I matter. And the tragedy, the tragedy of the pride parades of the Western world today is that nobody's gonna find it where they're looking for today. So we can choose. We can either go down the path of the sexual revolution and we're gonna find ourselves caught up in this paradox. I'm looking for meaning within a philosophy that says meaning is not possible. Or tonight I can accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. and I receive his righteousness by faith. I receive the righteousness of Christ by faith and I receive the gift of eternal life. Moses put it this way. It says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. God is not willing that any should perish. God is not willing that any should perish regardless of what they say their sexual orientation or their gender identity may be. God did not say that eternal life was only for the heterosexuals in straight marriages. He wants eternal life for every, part, every member of the human race, including me and including you. And he's made it possible for every member of the human race to turn from a philosophy of despair to turn to a philosophy of life. He's made it possible for all of us to drink freely of the water of life, that we may have love and joy and hope and peace and gentleness and self-control within our characters. The things this world cannot give us. You cannot buy it in Walmart. You cannot buy it in Amazon. These are things only God can give. It's the fruit of the Christian experience. It's not just I have a hard life today that I look forward to eternity tomorrow. God says, I will transform your experience of life today. Your life may be black and white. I'll turn it into glorious technicolor. And so God says to us tonight, choose life, whoever you may be, wherever you may be, regardless of your past, regardless of the philosophy that you were raised with, regardless of who you've slept with or want to sleep with, God is still appealing to you tonight. Choose life. 
so that you and your descendants may live. It's a beautiful appeal from the Lord Jesus Christ. Choose life so that you may live. It's open to all. So I want to invite you tonight, you know, our time is almost up here, but I invite you to bow your heads with me. If you're watching online, I would like to invite you to bow your heads with me. And we're just going to invite the Lord Jesus Christ into our lives tonight. Jesus, I've heard a lot about you. Sometimes you're a swear word. Sometimes, Jesus, people have whacked me over the head with your name. But Jesus, tonight, I want hope. And I want meaning. And I want forgiveness. I want the shame washed away. And I want a purpose and a future with hope. Tonight, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for the mistakes I've made. And what you did on Calvary was for me. And I accept it by faith tonight. I'm going to trust you, Jesus, that when you come again, you're going to come looking for me. Tonight, Lord Jesus, give me your mind. Fill me with your spirit. Guide me in the path I should walk. Grow me and wash away the works of the flesh and replace them with a beautiful harvest of beauty and joy in my life. Tonight, Jesus, I'm that lost sheep and I'm coming home to you, the lost shepherd. Thank you for loving me. Walk with me from this day forward. And when you come again in the clouds of glory, Jesus, please look for me. In your holy name I ask, amen.